Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is April 11th, 2021, and you are now watching Real Talk with Ronnie live on Facebook Live. So this is the first time that I'm doing this on Facebook Live, and I want to credit my guest tonight for giving me this great idea. In the past, I've been uh, taping my segments and then uploading them on YouTube a few days later, but this is the first time I'm doing a live, and I'm so glad to be back. And this time we are, we actually are here on real time. So the slogan of my show is real talk, real news in real time. And today we actually are here in real time. So uh, before we begin, I just want to say thank you for joining me tonight. You know, I've had a busy past few months. Uh, for those of you who may not know, I am running for office in Bern County here in Jersey. I am running for county commissioner. Um, for those of you <clears throat> who don't know what a county commissioner does is basically a legislator on the county level. And for those of you who want to get involved in my campaign and learn more about my campaign, I welcome you all to go to my Facebook page and you can uh, find more about my campaign. Um, you can go to facebook.com slash Ronald Wynn USA. That's the official Facebook page for my campaign. And if you want to email me and my campaign and learn how to get involved, you can do so at ronaldlynnusa at gmail.com. Um, on the county ticket, we have a great ticket. On the top of our ticket, we have Bob Kugler, who was the chief of police in Saddlebrook. He's been the Saddlebrook chief of police for the past 25 years. He's served the people of Saddlebrook for 35 years. His family has been a staple in Saddlebrook for many, many years. I believe his father was mayor of Saddlebrook. Uh, so Chief Kugler is running for county sheriff. Uh, for county clerk, we have Bridget Kelly. Bridget Kelly is from the infamous uh, Bridgegate. Uh, you know, she was unfairly blamed for that, and uh, she was vindicated. The U.S. Supreme Court overturned her, her uh, conviction 9-0, to zero, and uh, she's vindicated. You know, she's literally been through fire, and she has come out of that ordeal stronger than ever, and I believe she will make a great county clerk. Uh, for a county surrogate, we have Simone. Simone uh, ran for a freeholder last year. Um, she is an MIT graduate. She is brilliant, and we're happy to uh, have her. And my running mate for a county commissioner is Tim Walsh. Tim Walsh has been a leader in Burden County politics for many, many years. And uh, yep, so all together, the five of us, we are making up the dream team for Bergen County, and I believe this year we will do really, really well. So once again, if you want to learn more about my campaign, go to my Facebook page, Ronald Lynn USA at Facebook, or you can email me at RonaldLynnUSA at gmail.com. All right, that's it. <clears throat> that's uh, all I'm going to do tonight about my campaign. I'm done plugging about it. But, you know, I would not be a you know a good candidate if I did not talk about my campaign on my own show, right? So anyway, for tonight's show, um, I'm very happy to have on our show Mike Asso. Mike Asso is a small business consultant, and uh, he is widely known in Bergen County politics and in Bergen County as the founder of his own political podcast, My Views with Mike Asso. <clears throat> his show can be found on Facebook Live. He does it on a regular basis. And you can search for My Views with Mike Asso on Facebook, and you can get to his Facebook page. All right, so without uh, further ado, let me bring on Mr. Mike Asso. Hey, Mike. That. Hey, Look Mike. That, Ron. Good to see you, man. How You're are you? finally live. Yeah, finally <laughs> live. It's been a long time since I've been live. And I'm happy that uh, we have you on our show tonight. I'm, uh, I'm honored you are, to be here. Yeah, you are breaking my Facebook Live cherry tonight. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. Better you say it than me. <laughs> yeah. All right, Mike. So uh, I'm sure a lot of people know who you are. But for those who don't know, why don't you tell us who are you and what makes you tick? Uh, just a lifelong resident here in New Jersey, uh, born and raised in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Uh, uh, have two wonderful children, Dylan and Sienna, uh, currently separated with my wife, but she still lives here. It's a cockamamie situation, <laughs> but you know what? We make the best of it right, right. during COVID, right? Um, I'm a small business consultant. I've been in, in so many different industries throughout my career. Um, 
basically took over my brother's uh, CPA firm 11 years ago. I'm not an accountant or a CPA, just for okay. the record. Um, hired somebody, became he became my partner. So he does all the tax returns. So I don't have to deal with that stuff. But I deal with a lot of the small businesses. I specialize yeah. in little mom and pop businesses in the real estate and in um, construction most mostly. And, um, you know, that's pretty much me and the gist. I'm a longtime uh, baseball coach here, youth baseball coach over 35 years. First year that I'm like stepped out of being like really active right. uh, just to spend more time with work and with my children and everything. So now my mom is kind of sick, but we'll deal with that. You know, that. As it goes. Yeah. Yeah, it is what it is. You know, life always throws challenges at you. So, you know what? It's it's been kind of like a, this last year has been kind of like a massive transformation for me. Um, right. Started my live views. Uh, my first one was the beginning of May last year. Went on a little bit of a rant and I periodically go on and then started my own page probably a couple of weeks ago because a bunch of my friends and, and people I know said, you know what, you can't, you, it's become too argumentative, my posts. And so right. I said, all right, out of respect to try to keep peace, I'll set up this separate page and we'll take it from there. Okay. Had you on my Bergen County Republican page because sure. um, I'm endorsing all brand new candidates. I don't want no more rethreads. I want people that are fresh minds, fresh blood, and young to re-energize our Republican Party here in the in the state that we need. And um, had you on the other night. There was a blast. That there was yeah, great. Was time. Um, and I popped your cherry on. It was great. Um, and I'm honored to be your first guest on your live. So. Right. Let me know what you want to talk about. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, you're the guest of honor tonight. So, you know, I just want to get to know more about you. What makes Mike also tick? So, Mike, uh, you mentioned that you are a small business uh, owner and uh, consultant, right? So yes, being the fact that you're very vocal in politics, especially on the conservative side, do you find that it has, uh, you know, cost you business? Um, it, it hasn't cost me business. Actually, I've gotten business from from my partner who does personal okay. tax returns. Right. So we had an increase of like red people coming secretly coming in. So actually, right. um, and I always have a respect for, you know, we have a mutual respect. I always preach mutual respect and reciprocate and respect. And I have a bunch of a, a ton of clients that are Democrats and and we try not to we don't cross that line. You know, we just we, what we do is strictly business and we keep our political views out of it. Um, it was especially crazy when COVID hit and the businesses went down and the PPP loan started. And then first you had the EIDL loans and it was like my, you know, it was kind of like, oh, my God, I got to get going here. And it was kind right. of like an, an emotional roller coaster. And I'll never forget. And what triggered me to do my first my views was um, Mnuchin in the beginning of April was saying we're going to run out of money right. for small businesses in that first round of PPP. And they were playing politics. You know, Pelosi's playing politics and and I'm going, you know what, we got to. You, sometimes you got to put the politics on the side and you got to do what's right for the for the business owners here who especially here in Jersey were shut, you know, and we needed to get them some kind of Band-Aid. And they were playing the politics. And so I looked at um, my congressman, which was Bill Pascrell here in CD9, and he's talking about how to make masks and blaming Trump. And I'm like, this is a guy who's like on the House Ways and Means Committee right. that should be pushing Pelosi, who's you know, they're longtime allies here to say, hey, you've got to, you know, we got to start getting money into our small business. We have to put the politics on the side. And you saw with Pelosi and McConnell, and they do the same thing over and over and over again. And I just started getting ticked, not just at Pelosi and Schumer, but at McConnell as well. And I'm not a big fan of Mitch McConnell. And, the, and everybody who follows me on my Facebook knows I'm not, I hate Mitch McConnell. <laughs> so what happened was, we ran out of funding and I was furious. What 
what I saw was business owners here in Jersey panic because it was supposed to save their employees from going to unemployment. So here we are. We don't know when the, that extra money was coming in. My phone is ringing 24-7 through the hook. We had the smaller community banks. I'll give you a uh, connect one. I'm going to connect. I'm going to plug connect one bank. They were fantastic. Valley Valley Bank, fantastic. All the little community banks were right. fantastic. The big major banks, living nightmare. Well, that the chase is the bank, right? Just the, uh... living nightmare. Yeah. So the, uh, now bank. we're we're stuck in limbo because there's no money coming in, and we went through like two payroll cycles and to a small business owner, it's a tough decision because like, sh are we getting it? Are we not with right. the PPP? Do I fund, do I put my own money in this? Do, what do I, you know, so you're trying to, you know, I was trying to go and navigate through like, well, you, you, I, I'm sure they're going to pass another, you know, more funding, but we just don't know when. Yeah. And what I saw out of these mom and pop owners you know, I don't deal with any big anyone big. I deal with little mom and pops, little dance studios, hair salon, right. construction guys who were shut down. And it was chaos. And I that's when I did my first live. I called out Bill Pascrell. I'm like, you, you we need to do this. Right. And they finally got the next round going. We went through, and it was as I said, it was living chaos, trying to go into each one of the banks, set up their own different things. It was so crazy and it's i spent literally um, all my days trying to get all my little business clients money for their payroll but at some point you're like they they funded so many couple of weeks three weeks two three weeks of payroll for, out of their own pocket and they're shut so now you start dealing with that emotion right it was scary it well was you scary know, there for a while thank god for firms like like yours because i think uh, what you said is completely right there's a lot of i mean the uh, ppp loans they are structured and work well for big companies right for, right. for the uh, bigger firms but for the small like mom and pop shops right they really have no guidance and no direction on how to get these loans or how to seek this this type of help um i think it's great that there are companies so, uh, you know such as yours that kind of guide them along right because they're kind of lost <clears throat> Yeah, as I just said, my phone was ringing right. from seven in the morning till midnight every night. Right. And, and, and you're watching people who had, you know, you have your life savings. You know, these, again, these are little, they have their life savings. They work 80, 90 hours a week. They have children in college. A lot of them are in their mid 50s. Like, right. They were looking like, you know, you, you start hearing the real truth about these, these little small business owners. They're like, I'm, I'm in my mid 50s. I have, children in college yeah <clears throat> if i close my business what am i going to do it was like where am i going to go where am i going to get a job if everything was closed it was anxiety it was emotional and it was a real difficult time because i'm a real compassionate person and then to boot there was people that were friends of my clients that said hey can you help my friend out because their account or whatever couldn't do it didn't want to do it you know, so I wound up doing that. I wound up doing like 75 of them. Right. And it was really, you know, it, it was pretty wild because, again, you, you were starting to worry about when they opened up that second loop money, will they run out again? So you had a race against the clock. And it was it was tough navigating through it. So, yeah. but, you know, we got through it. And uh, now we're doing the forgivenesses and we're doing another round. So you were back here again. So it's been, you know, uh, today I spent, I was going to go to my office, but I spent today preparing because I have a bunch of small clients that are ready to go into that next round, you know, to get it. And I said, let me prepare today because tomorrow when I go in, I can just get it going. Yeah, so, you know, tomorrow is a new day. Uh, there might be more stuff going on tomorrow that, that you don't know about, right? So it was good to, yeah. uh, you know, get that prepared. Uh, so, I mean, now that you've kind of done this for like a while, <clears throat> Can get streamlined, right? So it's a lot easier to process. Right. right. Yeah, it's a lot. Of, well, it's a different method because you got to show twenty five percent decrease in, in a quarter or a mm -hmm. year. So you have to go through all the bank statements and make sure you can fill her in. And some are like 
I think the melt, the bigger magic number was 20% to, to really help because 25% to a lot, to a small business. Okay. It's kind of, it was kind of a stretch. I, I thought 20% would be better. Right. Because you would help because you think about it, if you're 21% and you have to show bank statements, you have to show documentation. You just can't wing it. So I thought 20% because there was a lot of, there's a lot of companies, small businesses that are in that bubble of 20 to 25 that could use it, you know, 20 to 24%. Right. And then they're getting shut out because they're not in that 25%, but they're just as in bad shape as anything else. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Mike, uh, <clears throat> what is the name of your company and uh, what is the best way for viewers who are in need of your services to reach out um, to you? If, if, sure, if my name is, uh, the company name <laughs> is, it's a little tiny uh, firm, you know, in uh, Richfield, New Jersey, also in Butler. Office number 201-840-5444. The great thing and about it is- One more time, 201. 201-840-5444. I actually oh, forgot the number because everybody <laughs> everybody calls me on my cell. I give right. everyone my clients my cell number. That's how right. that's how right. I do business. I do every, so everything- your number your info up here, right? Does that look yep. right to you? Okay, yep, so yeah, so if you're a small business owner or a mom, or if you have a mom and pop shop, and if you're just completely lost yep. in this, you know, current time, uh, you can give Mike a call, also in Butler, 201-840-5444. Um, yeah, well, I appreciate like, the plug. I wasn't intended yeah, sure. to do it. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, look, we are here to try to help people, right? <coughs> um, <clears throat> so this is, you know, the least that I can do, right? So Mike, <laughs> appreciate it sure sure so mike um <clears throat> so aside from your small business firm uh what what else keeps you busy especially during the pandemic uh during the pandemic was um as i said during during the pandemic my wife and i kind of separated um which was uh tough uh right. you have i have my two children home right my one son he plays baseball and he wasn't playing. So that was a big eye catcher. You know, my one daughter, she, my daughter, she could be by herself and she would have the greatest time. But my son, <clears throat> he's so accustomed to playing and being doing baseball, you know, throughout the winter and everything. He was doing like five nights a week during the winter. And then all of a sudden it just shut. And um, so you're trying to balance that, you know, um, then you're living on a whole different world now. You're like, I got to get food. I got to get all this. So you're trying to navigate all that stuff. And, um, you know, it was it was a really – I said this in the beginning of COVID. I said one of two things are going to happen to, to families. Either you're going to have more babies or you're going to get divorced. So it was going to be one of the two. So, <laughs> so I might be heading down number two. But, you know, it is what it is. You know? But well, we make the best yeah. of it. Yeah, you know, the education system was – it was it became nothing mm -hmm. you know i think that took a toll as well um i used to be on the board of Ed Edu education here in fort lee um and i saw that as well you know i gave them the benefit of the doubt because you're trying to go into remote learning you know they did the best they can you know between march and and june you know they did the best they could you know not a big fan of it now, but you know what? We can't have everything. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, this remote learning is good, but at the same time, it's not healthy, right? Like I mentioned on your show on, on Thursday night, uh, the, the teen suicide rate in New Jersey has gone up by 40%. Yeah. So that, that means out, out, out of every 10 teens, four are on the verge of offing themselves, right? right. So at some point, <clears throat> this needs to stop because – Remote learning, while it's easy and it's conducive, it doesn't beat the uh, in per the uh, the in person thing, right? The uh, right. in person experience is uh, is very needed, right? Right, right now, it's especially in, in a time when everyone is caved up in their homes, right? We need to be social. We need to be out there, and it's not just for our state of mind; it's for our pocketbooks too, right? Uh, businesses need to start opening. People need to start going Definitely. to work because bills still Definitely. need to get paid. Right. Right. You know, so we, you know, when you, when you, we touched on the education, I want to, let's go with, like, I live in Fort Lee. So we have a, you know, our children are, are 
pretty okay. You know, listen, there's always like we're spoiled, you know, like, oh, we want right. this. But <clears throat> but when you I really start to look at the students in Camden, the students in Trenton, the students right. in 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 Newark and Jersey City and all these inner cities, you know, areas, urban areas that have been shut down since last March. And, the, you know, they're already at a handicap opposed to like a suburban school district. And they already have bigger challenges on a normal day to day basis. So when you shut down and go remote, they are more impacted negatively than my children. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, I always go about the wants, likes and needs in life, you know, and I want and like. But these children in these urban areas they need, because if you look, there was a, an article uh, a while ago about the Camden uh, School District, and it was between the K through 2, K through 3, about 30% of the children were MIA. Right. <clears throat> and then you start talking about the high schools, MIA. And then you find out when you drill in why, well, who's, who stole their Chromebook, whose Chromebook they so sold, and whose family doesn't have internet access anymore, and you know, their, their family um, structures, who was already probably broken, mm -hmm. you know, it's already broken. So it's, it just amplifies yeah. their challenges. And for a lot of um, uh, inner city school children, right, or teens, uh, and it's like you said, their family structure is already broken or not in, in the best state. So for a lot of these teens, school and sports is the only thing that they have right. to uh, keep them going, to keep them out of trouble. And it gives them a purpose, right? So right. now that they no longer have school, they don't have these sports, uh, they can really lose their way. You know, I, I um, you know, since I'm campaigning for office, I've been in many, many towns. And I can't even begin to tell you the number one issue that most parents bring up to me is in regards to their children, right? Their children are sick and tired of being at home. Their children are sick and tired of not being able to participate in football and baseball and basketball. And one, one of the worst things that they bring up is that, you know, they call up the county commissioners or the county board or, or the mayors and they don't get a response. And this, this, you know, and not to plug myself, but this is one of the reasons why I'm running for office. Sure. Cause right now in Bergen County, we have a seven to zero uh, you know, stacked Democrat board, right? You have a machine against you. Yeah, there is a machine. Um, the Democrats are in there for many, many years. It's seven to zero. So there's no oversight. And when phone calls don't get answered, when questions don't get responded, that's a problem. And uh, parents are frustrated. The citizens of Bergen County are frustrated and children are frustrated. And that's why I'm running, because I want to bring back that accountability and that oversight back to our county government. <clears throat> right. Yeah. And, and, and I tip my hat to you. Like I said, for throwing your hat in the ring, you don't really have to do it. But it's it's a it's like a calling. It's nothing that right. you have an ulterior motive to yeah. try I mean, to advance your career um, in politics. The office of county commissioner is a part time job. It pays, right. I believe, it's like thirty five thousand each year. And it's a lot more hassle for what they're paying for, right? So I, so I mean, uh, you know, I'm not doing this for any other reason other than to try to clean up the system and, right. to, make a, and to make a positive change, right? And yeah. that's that, and that's what we're starting to see in the Republican Party in here in New Jersey. If we want to just stay with our state right. politics, you know, you start to see a lot of first time candidates and, and it's really become very diversified and it's 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 like for me i'm a i'm a i'm like a dinosaur here with with new jersey politics and it was oh it, it's great it's really engaging to see diversity it's it's different young minds in their 30s coming out stepping out and doing this where we've always had the 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 chosen ones to say you know well, you're going to run for this and you lose and you're just going to keep back and but you lose and it's really a breath of fresh air to have i said young candidates like yourself you're what 30s in your mid 30s yeah well, right yeah <laughs> yeah well whatever it is 
it's right. it's really good, but you're, it's your first time. So right. when you jump out there, it's for a reason. It's like when I ran for Board of Ed, I never intended to do it. But it was something at the at that time that triggered me to say, I got to get myself jump in the ring. Mm -hmm. I'm a little outspoken, you know, the way I do things. But at that point, I felt that I my community needed a, a someone that was going to stick up and do what they had to do, what's right for the community. And that it wasn't for anything else more than just for the children and the taxpayers of Fort Lake. So you're doing the same thing. And that's the honorable thing to do. You know, but there's other people that, you know, they always have a game plan and stuff like that to try to move up. And those are the ones that really give the parties a bad name. Right. You well, know, you so know, um, <clears throat> politics is a, is a very dirty business. It's a very dirty game. And that's why a lot of people don't want to get involved because once you're in there and especially if the other side feels that uh, you're a threat, they start, you know, slinging mud at you, saying right. lies and some of the most uh, vicious stuff. I mean, right. we look at our at our current race um, at the county level, and as I mentioned uh, during the uh, beginning of my show, we have Bob Kugler, right, who is mm -hmm. the current chief of police in, in Saddlebrook. He's running for a sheriff, and a couple of weeks ago, you know, there were allegations thrown against him that he was, uh, you know, misusing his office for something. But I mean, uh, those are completely false. I mean, it just so happens that Bob Kugler, his family owns a uh, you know funeral parlor. Funeral. Right? in Saddlebrook, and it's been there for what, like 50 years? Forever. Right, or probably more, right? <clears throat> and now, so, because he's the police chief, they are saying that he escorted police cars on funerals, and that it was an official, you know, misuse of, uh, you know, his uh, of his office. But, you know, what they failed to mention, that these police escorts are routine, right? It's routine. Yeah. And uh, they're done for only one reason. For safety reasons, you know, yeah. how, how many times are you on the highway and you see a funeral, a, 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 a procession go, right? And during the procession, you usually see a cop car in the front and in the back, right? Yeah. What is that there for? It's there for safety reasons. Right. And, uh, you know, now they're trying to say that he did something wrong and they're trying to charge him. And mind you, this isn't coming from the uh, county prosecutor. This is coming from the state attorney general. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> Mr. G. <laughs> right. Yeah. From Attorney General uh, Gruel, who, by the way, was the Bergen County prosecutor, right? And by the way, whose sister is the vice chair of the BCBO. So, I think a lot of these accusations are, well, not a lot of them. This whole thing is politically motivated. Right. It's a political prosecution is right. political persecution. And I think a lot of people, or most people who have a right mind, see it for what it is. <clears throat> Well, and this is what we, we spoke about the other night, but, you know, I'm a firm believer with the 95 percent of the media mm -hmm. ag against a Republican. Right. And I, you know, and everybody, when I talk about media, everybody thinks it's Fox News, CNN, MSNBC. News. No, no, it's every type of media, every type of media that that is published or communicated. And it's always, always slanted against a Republican. Right, always. It, it's always. And what's happening is true Democrats are stuck in denial mentally. See, everybody thinks I, I, I everything is about politics. No, this has been a slow drip indoctrination or manipulation over a long period of time. And now they're kind of, because when you hear something Nine out of ten times, you figure it's true, right? Right. Yeah. We saw that with Trump with the <clears throat> with the Russian collusion. Three yeah, you and know, a half years. I find that really really funny because uh, <clears throat> you know, with what just happened in 2020 with the uh, you know election, there's been numerous instances of election fraud, right? Sure. Numerous, and Democrats are saying there's no proof of that. But then when you look at the Russia collusion scandal and hoax, right? Democrats were pushing that for three, four years. Three and, and a half that, years. Right. And that was something that literally had no evidence. Right. So, I mean, this whole call for evidence, it really depends on the scandal, right? Right. If it's a, if it's a liberal manufactured scandal, then they don't really care about the uh, you know evidence. They will push it 
right? They will peddle it on CNN, on MSNBC, on every other station. But when it's something that was based on, you know, actual uh, facts and evidence, like what, it, like what just happened uh, last year, they don't want to talk about it. And no. they say there's, there's no evidence. But Here, it, it, <laughs> we touched upon, upon this the other night with the voter ID, okay? <laughs> So everybody says, you know, voter ID, if you're full voter ID, you're racist. But in, 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 in I go back into like a business standpoint. Let's talk about breaking it down into more common sense. We own a business, Ron, me and you. And right. we look at it and we say, you know what? We have some doubt on this side. We need to tighten it up for our clients, or our customers to have a, a better experience with it. Right. So we said, you know what? We already have this voter ID at, you know, at the polls. So why not just have, if we're going to do this mail-in service, provide ID when you mail it in? And, or you say, okay, well, let's try to expand more days, you know, instead of 10 and we do 21 and, well, you know, instead of having, you know, again, we're having a business. So do we really need everybody here till eight, eight o'clock? We make yeah. it till seven o'clock. So it's a, a practical common sense decision that <clears throat> if the media and the government never made any boo about it, it would have passed and nobody would have complained about it because we do have 35, I think 35 other states other than Georgia that need some type of identification. Right. So yeah. since Georgia is now, a, you know, one of those purple states, okay, it, it's now a, a swing state, they want to keep it that way. But in common sense, if you asked anybody, okay, would you, they'll be like, all right, if I, to, I yeah, I got to use an ID, I'll use it, I'll make a copy of the driver's license and I send it, you know, it just becomes, but the way the media prefers, portrayed it and the way government portrayed it they already threw it into their narrative right again through the mind if you disagree with this you're a racist so it was already out there it's not like you say if you disagree with it you're, you're an idiot or you know you have debate about it no, no they, they had to throw the word out. if you disagree with this then you're a racist right right because immediately <laughs> and this is the stuff that i just don't appreciate right you know in, in june of last year late may we had some several black lives matter protests going through fort lake <clears throat> i was with my son and they were playing in the park and they had, this guy comes up to me i knew the guy from my son's school and he's like we're talking about it. and he's like are you gonna go and i'm like no and he's like what do you mean and i'm like i don't believe in it you know it's become it's 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 become political it's not even about anything right next thing you know it in a in a thread on facebook i'm being called a racist you know then my son comes home one day and says i can't hang out with this kid because his parents don't want to want me hanging out with him because of me and mom you and mommy because we're racist i'm like have, have people lost their minds so i went into the thread that one and i'm like if you gotta you want to call me a racist Meet me at this park and call me to me in my face. You you don't know me. But right. that's the way they just, it's massaged in. It's like if you hear anybody talk about, with this voter ID, talking about Jim Crow. They heard it from the media. Nobody knows who Jim Crow is. Right. You know what I'm saying? So you could see when they talk about and where they're getting in their information from. And right. it's completely distorted. It's kind of like, it's complete. The, uh, yeah, with the uh, whole uh, immigration thing, right? Like President yeah. Trump, he wanted to stop illegal Im immigration, illegal, right? Illegal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I've been called a xenophobe for but, my well, my stance on illegal immigration. Uh, me too. You know, I have a lot of people telling me like, "Oh, Ronald, how can you be against immigration?" I'm like, "Well, a, I'm not against immigration. My parents immigrated to this country, right? But they so did it the right way. They did it legally." Um, there's a difference between legal and illegal. Right. President Trump and I think every uh, right-minded person or common-sense-minded person wants immigration. I mean, that's the bread and butter of our country, right? We are right. That's the fabric of our. That's yeah. the fabric of that's our the country. Fabric of our country. 
Um, and like, you know, we are make, we are a great country today because of immigration, right. because of legal immigration, right. the, the diversity that, that we have is what makes our, our country great. But the Democrats and the liberal media, they conveniently leave out that legal word. Right. They, they, call, they say, went to undocumented. Yeah. And they just say that we hate all immigration. And that's because they, they, what they do is with that, they play the humanity card right. that, you know, the, we're, we're inhumane for not doing this, yeah, and then, you know, and they, and, they put, and they slap the label on to make us feel right. guilty. And, yeah. And, but and actually, if you look at what Joe Biden, if you look at what Joe Biden is doing right now at our border or actually what he's not doing, that is anything but humane. Okay, because, uh, you've got thousands upon thousands of unaccompanied children and minors at the border or being brought to to the border by cartel right. members or by you know whoever, and uh, they're being used. They're being used. Right. And the media won't report on that. Uh, they only report about how Trump put kids in cages, which by right. the way was not true. Those cages were from Barack Obama's you know right. era. Um, so I mean, what the Biden you know team is doing right now is totally inhumane. Um, you know, he he hasn't gone to the border. Look, even then, let's let's even slice it down. I don't want to interrupt you, but on the sure. daily press conferences with the White House press conference, Jen Psaki says, like, oh, we're going to circle back to it or whatever. And everybody's OK with that. Right. You know, the White House press corps is OK with that. And there's another double standard that people don't realize, because if this remember when Trump was doing it, they were killing him. You know, here are you going to, Jen, you're going to say, okay, no follow ups, no anything else. <clears throat> and I'm trying to show people, you know, on my Facebook page, look at this reality. You, you know, we talk about the Hunter Biden gun. Right. I want you to think about this. Okay. His girlfriend, which is his. Uh, brother's wife or whatever his deceased well, brother's wife was very disgusting and like, all right think well, uh, well look, so <laughs> I, listen, I, i'm not even gonna go there but right. let's think about this the gun is in his truck right she takes the gun because she's feared for his life that he's going to take his own life right she doesn't take it to the police department right she doesn't she dumps it in a dumpster across the street from a school Right? Yeah. Everybody comes in. Forget about the Secret Service and anything else like this. Let's well, just think about common sense. Some guy finds the gun, right? Brings back the gun. And Hunter Biden got back the gun. I want you to, everybody, to think about common sense. This is what the media is talking about. This is not about politics now. This is about. I want people to see, but they cover it up and downplay it. Right. Because if you go after Hunter, well, he's had drug issues. Well, you're not supposed to have a gun if you got a drug. You got discharged from the military for drug issues. And how did you get a gun? It just doesn't make sense. But everybody brings it back to politics, but it's not. Right. And this is the stuff at this time that. We all get sucked in and, and they divert back to Trump or that they're going to divert it to gun control. But here's a guy, the vice president's ex vice president's son in 2018, they covered that up because if that was Eric Trump or Donald Trump Jr., it would be 24 7, 365. Oh my God. If it was Donald Trump Jr. or Eric Trump, they would be in prison by now. <coughs> they would be in prison. It would be <laughs> everywhere. Right. You follow? It would be even on Cartoon Network, they would be showing this. This is how crazy, and, and, and everybody's okay with this. And I'm saying, how can you be okay with this? You're seeing a blatant double standard in the media. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just mind boggling. And it's not even about politics. It's about blatant protection. It's about a little wrong. party. I mean, if you want to boil it down even more, uh, you know, you know, simply, it's about right and wrong. And right. the media, I mean, they they are providing cover for Hunter. Well, they've been doing it since day one, right? Um, 
I, I mean, the scandal with Hunter, you know, dealing with China, with, uh, you know, Russia, with all the foreign countries, that should have been a big issue. That should have been. But the only site that, that reported on this, you know, news was the uh, New York Post, right? They were the only right. one. Right. Every with other the laptop. News site, with the yeah, laptop. Every other news site uh, just provided cover. There was a blackout on this whole thing. Twitter. Thing. Twitter blacked it out. Facebook yeah. blacked it out. Twitter, Facebook, yeah. All, this, all these social all media. All the Instagram, sites. they all blacked it out. <laughs> they all blacked it out to provide cover right. long enough for the presidential race to come and go. And right. now we see a little bit more about it, right? But by now, right. you know, the damage is done, right? So right. <laughs> people don't care about that anymore. Um, right. So <clears throat> this is what the media did. Now, Donald Trump, I call him the narcissist because he is. Right. <laughs> he, in 2016, I didn't vote for him. I hand wrote John Kasich just to, for whatever. So I wasn't too sold on him because he's never a politician. So Kasich had uh, a history of balancing the budget. So I kind of liked him, and even though he lost or whatever, but I just said, you know what? Trump is not at this point, not my type of guy. So what the second, he was a media darling until he got to the nomination, right? He was on MSNBC. He was on CNN. He was a media darling. He was and a all the show. For, uh, for like NBC. I mean, his show, his show, The uh, right. um, Apprentice, was a cash cow. So, I mean, right. he was adored, and everyone right. loved him. I mean, he right. had a roast, right? I mean, there, there, was, there was a roast for Donald Trump on like Comedy he, Central. He was, on, he, was on, he was on every morning, pretty much every a lot, with Joe Scarborough on MSNBC right. in the morning with, right. with uh, Mika Brzezinski, okay? Yeah. Until he got the nomination. The second he got the nomination, it was the pit bulls came on to destroy this man, right? right. So now you have polling companies, like, which I can't stand, doing, you know, he's he's down 15, he's down 16, he's this, that. Just, it's all mind manipulation. You're right. manipulating the mind. The machine is now kicking 24-7. Bad, bad, bad. You know, everything out of thing, everything. And, and Trump fed into it, but what Trump, no one figured, there was that he outworked Clinton. I mean, he was doing three rallies a day for like a right. month. <clears throat> Clinton ran out of gas. She did. Let's yeah, be honest. Yeah. But, you know, to <clears throat> refer to Clinton, she still had more gas than Joe Biden, right? Yes. Yes, <laughs> she was, but she was more polarizing. That's why, but we'll talk about, yeah. but so anyway, but the second he, the second he won, it was full blown, we're going to destroy this man. And they did every day, 24 seven, every day. There's, 3%, 3% or maybe even 4% of the 95% of the media was po positive for Trump right. in three and a half years. And we can count the uh, the uh, media sites on one hand. Right. But I'm not even talking about what happened with Fox. Right. You know, in Fox, you know, in the, I'm talking about the other 95% of the media gave him 4% at the most positive coverage. And this guy did a lot policy wise, but they never wanted to talk about his policy. They just I mean, kept on demonizing him. In he didn't help his cause. In the but, Middle East, there were so many peace deals that, that Trump signed. I mean, he's the first president in a long while where, uh, you know, where he didn't get us into war. I mean, we've been at peace during the past four years of you know of like Trump's of uh, Trump's presidency, and that hasn't been done in a while, right? But that doesn't get talked about, <clears throat> right? It doesn't. I mean, what he's done for our, our, our domestic policy, what he's tried to do foreign policy wise, you know, if you notice, and I said this, this was the first debate between the debates between Biden and Trump. The foreign policy was never a discussion. It was never a discussion because we're at peace. Right. You know, Trump wanted to get people out with where the left wanted all our troops out, and he's trying to do it. But meanwhile, the media is destroying them. And they're agreeing with him. It's like you it's like what they've done now is manipulated so bad that the Bernie Sanders wing 
of the Democratic Party is running the show through Joe Biden. Right. Because they're the most vocal. Because a true Democrat, let's be realistic, a true Democrat will debate the old traditional way with a true Republican. Right. All right? Let's just be real. But now you got this nasty, outspoken group. And my and I know this firsthand because my wife, ex-wife, estranged wife, whatever you want to call her, <clears throat> in 2016 supported Bernie Sanders and and campaigned for him. Okay? <laughs> but she was so passionate about this until she really saw what the Democratic Party did to him during the primaries. Okay? And they sabotaged him. Right. And she saw that and she started to switch. So your wife she, is now a Republican or? My wife is more of a libertarian. Okay. Um, well, that's a big switch. She, she went from yeah, a, I mean, when a, I met my wife, a, a social, <laughs> a Bernie a, a, a supporter <laughs> to a libertarian. Uh, hey, Ron, you want to laugh? My, my <laughs> soon to be ex-wife, strange wife, whatever label you guys want to call her, I'm fine with it. But anyway, when I first met her, we met on Match.com. Okay. Here I am. I'm a Republican, and she is a left-wing liberal, right. social worker, Emily's List, that whole mo movement. They taught her how to speak out and get in people's faces. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I, we wound up getting married. I never knew how, but I think the only thing why she well, liked me was I drank, right? I drank and smoked, you know, whatever. But there was many nights where, you know, it was like crazy. So I'm kind of used to it. Well, together. Let me ask you, do you think the politics might have been a reason why you guys are now separated? Do you think that was an impact? I think it's it, 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 it's part of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of it is probably I would say it was the starting point. Right. Okay. Because. She looks at things differently than I do. I'm more of, I'm aware of things. Right. <clears throat> I don't go and go crazy. Where she is a really passionate person, what she believes in. And she just shouts things out. And, and I'm like, I, I want to live in awareness. Right. Where she's more of, again, coming back from that left-wing so, no. liberal movement. Right. Just throwing things in, in people's faces. And she's actually doing it against Democrats. Well, you know, um, crazy, crazier things have happened, right? I mean, your wife was a liberal. Now she's a, a uh, you know, a libertarian. A libertarian. <clears throat> um, because of COVID, you guys kind of separated. So who knows? Maybe you guys could still get back together. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I got bigger fish to fry right now in my life, but. <laughs> Whatever happens, happens. You know, well, you I'm going to pray for you guys. <laughs> anyway, well, listen, it, it, everybody says the same thing, but I'm like, you know what? I still have to live my life day to day. I still have the responsibility of the children. I'm self-employed. I got to put food on the table. Right. You, you got other things I have to deal okay. with. I mean, that's she's not going anywhere. She, I mean, we, we live here. So right <laughs> together. So we take that day by day. That's all, all right, I can so, say. We Mike, we've uh, dedicated a big part of the show talking about national politics, right? Right. Why don't we bring it back to Jersey? Let's talk okay. about Jersey politics for a little bit. Um, sure. This year in Jersey, uh, we have a governor's race. Well, we're one of two states in the country that have right. races going on this year. So New Jersey will definitely be in the spotlight uh, this fall. And like I said, uh, I believe what happens in New Jersey this year is a bellwether for what happens uh, next year during the uh, uh, midterm races, right? Next year, right. we have a lot on the line. Um, I think we're in a good position. The uh, GOP is in a good position next year to take back the House, take back the uh, Senate, right? Uh, oh, wait, I mean, in, in the House, the Democrats have a razor-thin margin. In the Senate, we're, we're literally tied. We're literally right. tied. Uh, and, of course, what happens next year will be a big indicator for what happens in 2024. Um, I know there are a lot of people that are hoping and praying and wishing that Donald Trump runs again in 2024, um, I think that's a big possibility, especially if the Republicans are able to take back the House and the Senate in 2022. Yeah. Um, but back to Jersey. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts on the governor's race and on everything else that's going on it's, now? Look, it, it, again, I'm going by the manipulation of the media. And right now you can start to see that the, 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 the three 
the three main people are, you know, between Mr. Singh, Mr. Chitterelli, and Mr. Rizzo, they're starting to heat up, right? I told you that the other night. It's going to be well, start being blood. Well, it's going to start day, being blood uh, in the street. Phil Rizzo, he qualified for a matching funds, right? Right. So um, he made. Them. But whatever the case, they're going to. It's it, it's it's historical. It's Jersey. Right. It's there's blood in the streets, but what we have to be careful here. All right, you can always go and throw some red meat against your opponent, but you have to be careful now because I don't. I keep going back to that 95% of the media, mm -hmm. okay, is that it will destroy whoever comes out with the nomination right. because you will see no – you'll see nothing about negative about Murphy, that Mama Luke from, from, from Trenton. Nothing, all right. And I, we met, we we spoke about this the other night. Can you just imagine if Chris Christie was governor and forty percent of the deaths that happened in nursing homes under his executive order, he would be well, he would be impeached, destroyed. He would be uh, hauled off to jail or prison. Destroyed. Right? Yeah, he there would, would be he, there would be picket signs every day in Trenton, murderer. Right. And the, and the media would be enabling this and leading this. But now it's all quiet. Right. You follow? So what they do is they look at Chitterelli, they look at Rizzo, they look at Hirsch, they'll look at any Republican that's going to be a threat to any Democrat in any race. And they'll, they'll you know, the Democratic Party will stick the pit bulls on. Right. Which is the media. Right? It's just the way, it's just the way New Jersey's been. Yeah. You know? Um, you know, and I was talking before about how Bob Kugler is being persecuted by the uh, state AG, right? And right. I I've said this. I mean, it shouldn't it, even be done by the state AG. Right. It should be done. Well, I mean, if it should be done at all, it would be from the from the county level, right? Right. It or, would be down more of whatever the case yeah, may be. But, but they're going straight to the top guy from right. the top because they view Bob Kugler as a threat. As a threat. And he is, because he's an outstanding candidate, and he will do a great job. And I really believe in my heart of hearts that he will be our next sheriff, right? right. But I was, I was saying that um, if the attorney general really wanted to do his job and investigate misconduct, he ought to look into his boss. Phil Murphy has literally been responsible for the deaths of over 8,000 people in our state, 8,000 right. veterans, 8,000 senior citizens, right? There are over 8,000 deaths in nursing homes because of the direct actions of Governor Phil Murphy. I mean, his people- And it's, under, right it's, uh, it's, in, it's, ir, it's undeniable. Ir, yeah. You cannot um, defend it. His people literally told him that, uh, you know, this is not a good idea. If you stick these patients in nursing homes, people that would not otherwise die will die, right? They told him this. And what did he do? He went ahead and did it anyway. So, I mean, this to me is, uh, you know, is negligence, it's misconduct, and it is uh, just outright shameful. But, you know, he's not being looked at by the AG because he's his boss, right? But, you know, if the AG really wanted to do his job, he would be looking into his boss, but he's not going to do that. So but the media is not even doing their job. Right. Let's, let's think about this. When the height of COVID happened in April, you know, the end of March, beginning of April, right? He, the, the, the Jitrul, which I call the arrogant Jitrul in New York, you know, uh, Cuomo and de Blasio, Cuomo's begging, you know, can we get the USS Comfort here, right? They get the USS Comfort here. They redo the Javits Convention Center in amazing time. They, they redo here the Meadowlands Expo and other situ other places, right? <clears throat> so here we are, they sign this executive order and, he, and I guess he's, He's following dumb because dumber is following dumb. So Murphy is following Cuomo. So Cuomo puts the executive order. Murphy does the same thing. Okay. And now what happens? So you look at it and you're like, you had the USS Comfort. And again, we're in Bergen County, right? We had three hospitals, Englewood, Teaneck, and Hackensack, a stone's throw to get to the USS Comfort. Right? Yeah, literally. You had the waterway. You had any access that you needed to get these people to the to the USS Comfort, to any other area. 
What did they do? They put him back in the nursing home. So you look at one or two situations. Was it political because you didn't want to give Trump the credit for doing this? Or are you completely negligent or right. irresponsible or incompetent of what you just did? Your very first duty as an elected official is to is to provide safety for your citizens. Yep. But you don't see the media talk about this. Right. I mean, look, at, at best, he was negligent. At worst, it was deliberate and uh, political. And, you know, they right. literally put people's lives on the line. And people died because of these political, you know, uh, calculations, right? Right. So it's, it's very, very shameful. And the media doesn't doesn't focus on it. And, and here's, here's the other thing. We touched upon this. This was already a pattern that started in Washington, right? Remember when the first doses came out in the nursing homes in Washington? Right. It was, so if you looked at what happened in Washington with the nursing homes, common sense says, I can't put these people back in, right? So you, you are you completely incompetent, negligent or political? It's, it, it's nothing's good here, but the right. media covered it. Covered it all up. Yeah. And now the and then here's the best one, Ron. The families who are, you know, want answers, the media plays them as po being political. Right? It's like these are people that they want answers why they did this. These are people that and they died alone. You know what I'm saying? You, you, you gotta. You got to look at these people died by themselves. It, it, it's it's like unbelievable. And, look, and nobody wants to report people today can no longer hug their grandparents or you know talk on the phone with their grandparents because of the direct actions of this governor and of you know of this political party, right? right. So I mean, uh, you know it's it's just is downright wrong. It's and, and you have every other Democrat. See, the Democrat, you see what happens with us, Repu the Republican Party, right? Everybody's speaking. You know, we got all these different wings and different factions. Who's a rhino, this and that, right? Blah, 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 right? We're all like this, right? It's like a big hurricane. Right. But if you watch the Democratic Party, shh, stay silent, total line. Even though they may hate Murphy, right? They know the marching orders. They're more disciplined than the Republican Party. Now, why do you think that is, though? <clears throat> because it took them so long to get to this point of mm -hmm. power. It's been a long time process. Right. I want you to go back. Remember, we spoke about Reagan back in 84, right? Walter Mondale was a liberal. He lost 49 states, right, in 88. They got curled. They tried to do the same. It didn't work. They shifted with Clinton, a moderate, right? They, they he, Clinton never got 50% of the vote both times, right? Then they bring in Gore. Gore makes a mistake, you know, whatever he lost. I thought he made a tactical mistake keeping away from Clinton because he lost Tennessee and Arkansas. Yeah. Then nobody wants to talk to him about that. But anyway. He lost state of Tennessee, but anyway. What's that? He lost <laughs> so, his own yeah. home state. He wins either Arkansas or Tennessee. There is no discussion. Right. Okay. But that the media never told you that. Let's go now. You got the the guy from Massachusetts who ran against um, Kerry. Kerry. Yeah. And the first thing was he's left of Ted. You remember that he was left of Ted. He's got the wind thing going on. Right. So they tried and it didn't work. So they disguised Obama as a, a hope and change moderate. Where he was, they started to disguise these people. And they're doing the same thing now. They knew this progressive agenda, which they have had in works for, for years. The only way they can do this is disguising. That's why Biden's there. Yeah. That's why Biden was kept quiet. Well, you because know, they have this progressive Biden's agenda term right now is essentially the third term of Barack Obama. I think everybody right. that. It's basically the same thing. And now what you're starting to see is 
what what you're really starting to see in the socialist movement, I don't even call them ultra progressive. They are socialists. Let's call it a spade a spade. Right. The only way to win seats is through primaries. So these socialists like AOC and all these socialists, they win in the primaries. Right? Yeah. So when you get to the general, the strategy is, well, we just want to hold the seat. Right? So the machine which is a true Democrat is saying, well, we just, we, if we lose the seat, we'll never get, we, you know, it's harder to get back. So they just back these socialists. It's just to keep power. Right. And, and that's how the socialist movement knows how to win elections. Okay. They it's know how to win elections. They win they at the prime. Tap at the heartstrings, right. And, and, and tug at the heartstrings of, you know, people who, who want to genuinely do good, right? Who want to help the poor, who want right. to do this and that. Um, yeah, so so they know how to do that. And you know what? I mean, a lot of people who are socialists or who are attracted by AOC and that kind of stuff. A lot Which of is the younger manipulated right. generation and that's not in the have good intentions, right? They have good intentions. They do want to help out. <coughs> but what they don't understand that the socialism way of helping out is actually not helping out at all, right? It's actually hurting everybody. But, uh, you know, when you're young, you are just, oh, you know, you have a uh, pure heart, right? And you think that what you're trying to do is, is, is helpful. But, you know, as you, as you get older, as you get wiser, you learn about the, uh, the intricacies uh, of different political thought. And you can see that, okay, wow, you know, if I really wanted to help some, to help a child or to help a poor family, Socialism is actually not the way to go about it. <clears throat> right. 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 It's the opposite. Yeah. So right. if you look at yeah. you look at and I and I use this analogy. How do we get here? Right. And I look back and I've been a, a, a youth baseball coach for as I said 35 36 years. So here we are in the in the you know in the mid 80s, you always used to give a trophy to the first to the championship champion, second place if you were you made all stars or you graduated. Then all of a sudden you started to shift and you started seeing, well, little Johnny, he he needs a trophy, yeah. right? Everybody, everybody gets a trophy, a trophy. <laughs> because you feel, you're, you're hurting his feelings. Right. <clears throat> this is a doctrination of 30 years. Universities, I want you to think about universities. When I, grad, when I went, I never went to college, but my age group, a lot of us went community college or they went to work. A, a, a college degree wasn't as so important because we had trades, we had other things, you know, now, then they said, you're nothing without a college degree, which is completely false, completely false. They, they created a false narrative that if you don't go to college, you're nothing. And that is the complete lie. Right. Cause not every child is designed to go to college. Yeah. I mean, look, um, that's the reason why we have trade schools, right? Uh, there's a lot of crafts that people can learn going to a trade school uh, where they can make a lot of money, right? They sure. Can make living. Um, yeah, so I mean, look, the issue of education, I do believe that everyone needs to get a, a good education, right? And I think education is key to one's success, right? But, you know, uh, the, the problem is nowadays, everyone is too educated, right? Um, everyone is, is oversaturated with education and trade school gets overlooked. But oftentimes, a lot of the trades can earn you a lot of money too. <clears throat> yeah, look, it might. In, 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 we used to have, you know, shop class. We used to have, you know, all these different classes when I was there, mm -hmm. and now they're gone. Out of high school, you know, they're gone, and right. it's not because mm -hmm. the student. It was kind of like maybe a subliminal saying, you, you know, you're not going to be a mechanic. Mechanics don't make that much. You want to be this. You want to be that. You oh, don't know. know. The mechanics that make a ton of money. <laughs> they, they make oh like, like six figures. <laughs> the majority of my friends that barely right. made it out of high school make more than a lot of my friends that right. went to college. Right. Like, it's a proven fact. Like, Mike, look, okay. I have a law degree. I, I've got a PhD, but I know mechanics that make a lot more than me. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I, know car right. I know carpenters that make a ton yeah. of money. You know? So, yeah. but that's an education in itself. And then I started when I got onto the board of ed, and we started. I started learning about, you know, they brought in park, you know, um, and it's really the, the part of park is college and career. 
you know, that's the two C's at the end. And I sat there and I'm like, well, where are the career questions on this thing? And what they lost was, and again, I go back to when I was a, a student, my teachers had the free will to teach the way they wanted to, to reach me. Right. We had like a coup to prep, you know, if you wanted, you took the SAT and you, and you whatever, to, you know, to get it, if you wanted to go to college. Now they put this all or nothing game in that if right. you're not doing well in these standardized tests, you're not graduating. That is nonsense because every child learns at different levels. Okay. And I have two children. My daughter reads, she could read Moby Dick without even a problem. Right. But she's the dumb as a snake that she can't add two plus two, right? <laughs> My son, on the other hand, is like a mathematician. He's trying to figure out batting averages and whip in baseball. Right. But he can't even read. He, he barely wants to read. So you have to look at this. And what they do is they put – and I, you know, I always have this misconception I'm anti-teacher. I'm anti-teacher's union. The teachers, I feel, that should – if you get hired, and I'm a baseball coach, so my way of teaching is different than other people's ways of teaching baseball, right? Mm -hmm. However, we have to get the most out of our uh, my players to come out. I'm not may, may be for everybody. But mm -hmm. in education, it's the same thing because you're learning, right? So right. development. So they just keep pushing. Like they just came out, state of New Jersey. Uh, we're not going to take the, ninja, you know, the standardized test for the second straight year. Oh, my God. It's like. Oh my God, the poor child. Can we get this get the kids in school first and worry about who cares about this stuff? This is what's crazy about this. But I don't want to see the teachers teaching to a test and then being subject to, you know, to that because that's not what they signed up for. They signed right. up to teach to be creative, to reach. If you got 20 different children in your class. They might have to do 15 different ways to reach that kid. No, now it's like we're back in the old days. Mm -hmm. And it's just not working in the 21st not century. Right. It's not right. It's not working and something really needs to change, right? Okay. And you but, mentioned it the, you mentioned it the other night. Yeah. These children don't have critical thinking skills. They don't. Yep. And they don't. Of, yep. And uh, it's not just the children. I, I think much of the Democratic Party, they don't have critical thinking skills because they're all, you know, parroting the same Illogical notion. <laughs> many, many well, times. because remember what I said, they have to stay inside right. the line. Yeah. Where the Republicans are like the Hatfields and yeah. the McCoys within themselves. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, that's good and bad, right? It shows that Republicans like us, we have critical thinking and we can argue with one another, right? But at the end of the day, after a primary, we all come together and we all support our candidates, right? Because right. uh, and that's so important, especially this year, especially in this state where we have a governor's race, um, um, you know, and all the races, including my my race, right? Um, and you listen, you're going to have a tough race. Yeah. And I'll tell you the reason why. If you and Tim, right, it's Tim Walsh with you, right? Right. Right? Yeah, if yeah. you and Tim start to, remember what I talked about, if you start to dent the armor of the machine, they'll sick the They'll sick the tack dogs on you and find whatever garbage it is that could be when you were six years old. And like I said, uh, you know, the minute they start attacking me, it shows that you I'm, know you got I'm doing something right, right? Right, you are. Yeah. But what happens is that, but you don't hear anything about your opponents. Your opponents are being right. covered for whatever sins they have. Right. All well, right. And trust me. You know, I'm this... gonna be running a campaign, uh, a winning campaign. I'm in it to win. It. So you know, the media may not want to talk about my opponents, but trust me, I will. <laughs> yeah. Look, you think yeah. about it. We had the the veterans' home in Paramus, right? right? Big problem. They all stayed silent. They didn't call Murphy up and make a big thing and say, "Jesus, God, you got to do something here," right? But if it was Chris Christie. They would be in front of every camera in every news cycle, the Bergen Record, the Star right. Ledger, and everything else, calling for Christie's head. That is yeah. reality, and people don't and realize on, it. And on that note, Mike, so we are coming up our hour mark. Uh, I'll, oh, give wow. you one, I'll give you one minute. 
to talk about one minute. One, to talk about. Yep. one minute. One minute. Your, your one thing. Deal. Because it's you, I want you to vote Bergen County, Ronald Joseph Lynn, and what's it? Uh, Walsh, Tim Walsh, yep. uh, and Tim every Walsh. Republican, vote them in. We have to start making a dent in the armor for whatever reason. If you feel, I, and I want you, this is a big, pivotal year. We cannot have four more years of Murphy, okay? And we got to start, start evening up every political office we have. This is a very pivotal year. This is the year that we can do it. We have a lot of young, give these young candidates a chance. That's it. Thank you, Mike. And also just to give a little plug about your show. So, Mike, uh, your show is My Views with Mike Osso. You can yeah. search for it on Facebook. There's a Facebook page. That's his official Facebook page for his show. Please like it and share it. Mike has Yeah, a I'll be going on sometime this week, probably on Friday, because I'm going through the April 15th. So I'm going to be kind of not, even though I have another month. We're still trying to push everything through April 15th. So probably next weekend. I'll have a good right. one because I'm. I got some other things I want to talk about. So right. stay tuned. Sure. And also, if you are a small business owner, if you're if you're a mom and pop shop and you are lost in this sea of PPP and you know, all nonsense, right? And you need some guidance and you need like a guiding light, please call up Mike and his firm, also in Butler, right? 201-840-5444. They have been helping a lot of people in this process, right? And uh, they know what they're doing. So call them up. Call Mike up. He will help you. Okay. And uh, once again, Mike, thanks for coming on the inaugural. Excellent. Thank you for the opportunity. Facebook sir. live show of Real Talk with Ronnie. We'd love to have you on again, Mike. Oh, anytime. Nothing but the best for you. I'm here for you. Whatever I can do to make you win, I'm here for you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mike. Okay, Mike, have a great night, and we'll be talking to you soon, okay? Peace out. Thank you. All right. Peace out, Mikey. Okay, everybody, so that was a great show tonight. Um, once again, to plug my campaign, if you want to learn more about my campaign, please go to my official Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash Ronald Lynn USA. On my Facebook page, you'll find out ways on how to get involved, how to donate, and uh, how to help us win. Because like Mike said, every race is important, and all politics is local. Uh, if we, if we want to start making the big changes, we got to start from the from the local level. That's in our towns, on the county level, on the state level, right? Only when we can change and flip those seats can we go on and make changes on the federal level and on the bigger level. So please go to my Facebook page to learn more about my campaign. If you want to contact my campaign, go to RonaldLynnUSA at gmail.com. RonaldLynnUSA at gmail.com. And finally, I invite one and all to like my show, Real Talk with Ronnie. If you think you have an interesting story to share, please contact our booking department. Uh, you can contact us at Ronald, uh, sorry, <laughs> Real Talk with Ronnie at gmail.com. Okay, Real Talk with Ronnie. And of course, our Facebook page is Real Talk with Ronnie. You can follow us on YouTube, same handle. Real talk with Ronnie. And finally, just to give you my um, the email again, it's realtalkwithronnie at gmail.com. Once again, we are live every Sunday, 8 p.m. on my Facebook page. We're so happy and thankful for Mike also for uh, you know coming on our first show and for showing me the light when it comes to Facebook Live. All right. So everybody, have a good night. Um, have a good week. And I'll see you all next Sunday. Same time and same place, okay? Good night and God bless. Bye-bye.